Good morning. My name is David Burton. I am Senior Fellow in Economic Policy here at the Heritage Foundation. And I'm glad that you all could join us. And I'd also like to extend a welcome to those who are watching on the internet. Um, this is the second in a series of uh, presentations on the ethics of uh, free enterprise. It's called the free markets, the, the ethical economic choice. Uh, today's speaker is John Thomasy. Uh, he's the Romeo Elton Professor of Natural Philosophy at Brown University. He's twice been awarded university prizes for excellence in undergraduate teaching. He's the founding director of the Political Theory Project, an independent research uh, center at Brown. He also has an appointment at the University of Arizona Center for the Philosophy of Freedom, where he is a university associate and research professor. In the past, he's held positions at the University Center for Human Values at Princeton, the Department of Philosophy at Stanford, and the Safra Center for Ethics at Harvard. Uh, he, in addition to numerous scholarly articles and other articles, he's the author of two books uh, and has a number underway. Uh, the first is Liberalism Beyond Justice, Citizen Society and the Boundaries of Political Theory. And the second is Free Market Fairness, which is our subject today. Um, <clears throat> he received a bachelor's from Colby College and did his graduate work in political philosophy at the University of Arizona, where he received a master's, and at Oxford uh, in Great Britain, where he had a bachelor's in philosophy and a PhD. Uh, Professor Tomasi's work is very unusual in that it provides a principal defense of robust property rights and free enterprise, while also embracing the concept of social justice, a concept usually associated with the political left and usually attacked by conservatives, classical liberals, and libertarians because of the aggressively egalitarian interpretation that most advocates give to the idea. Thus, while he is a staunch defender of economic liberty, he also supports government provision of certain social services such as education designed to further economic opportunity and a safety net designed to alleviate poverty. In that, he's more in keeping with the positions that any practical limited government politician would adopt, particularly today. But even many of the framers supported state government action along those lines. For example, Thomas Jefferson supported education. He also defends economic liberty from a more Kantian perspective, uh, emphasizing the uh, importance of human dignity and worth rather than a typical Lockean natural rights perspective so often associated with uh, philosophers in the conservative or classical liberal tradition or a natural law tradition associated with uh, many conservatives. In short, his work is original, clear, accessible, and I wholeheartedly recommend that you read his books. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Tomasi. Thank, thank you, David. And um, thanks, all of you, for coming. It's a very short plane ride from Brown University to the Heritage Foundation. But although the plane ride is short, in some ways it feels like a very great distance to travel to go from Brown to here. Um, I have been teaching at Brown for 20 years, and it's a place I, I dearly love. Um, I've only spoken at Heritage, I think, three times or four times uh, in, in my career. But I've always felt particularly at home whenever I come here. So um, I'm just glad to be back, and I'm really delighted um, to have this chance to, to, speak, to speak with you. So um, as David warned you, my background's in philosophy. I've been increasingly interested in public policy, and I've had the chance, uh, to me, of surprising opportunities to um, advise some, some, some politicians and government leaders on public policy matters regarding my philosophical ideas, most notably in Sweden and India, and most recently in, and currently in, in Chile. Um, but I am a philosopher, and I want to just begin by saying something about what philosophers do. Because philosophers are strange. And what we do is something very odd. And sound, so what I'm going to do is I go through, as I speak with you, it may sound odd to you. Um, but I want to just, just sort of tell you what we do and why, why it may matter. So what philosophers do um, when we're doing just pure philosophy, pure political philosophy, 
is something like making maps of the stars in the sky. So philosophers pick out constellations. They imagine ideal societies. They imagine a society functioning the way they think, given their various value systems, that they think an ideal society would function. And then they uh, describe those constellations of uh, what a just society might look like, a perfectly just society might look like. And then they hope that when politicians um, have their hands on the ship of state, on the wheel of the ship of the state, that they will look at those constellations and they'll steer this ship of state towards what they think justice is. Um, what we have now in our current environment is a situation where there are two main rival political ideologies. That is, again, I think speaking from a philosophical perspective, there's lots of variations um, among the different philosophers who point these two different directions. But still, speaking very broadly, there are sort of two major constellations about justice, two major constellations that philosophers argue about in terms of which one is the most just one. And those two constellations that philosophers have picked out and argue for are very much reflected in the political debates that we have in our country. So the divisions we see in our society, especially when they're ideologically expressed, are very often, sometimes un, 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 unself-awareedly, reflections of these debates philosophers are having. And the current debate that philosophers are having is worth looking at for us. I think it can help inform our understanding of where our society is. And more important, in my view, it may help us think more optimistically about a better place we could go, um, a better way we could do politics, a higher moral ideal that I'll be describing in a moment. But first, just for the beginning, the, the more, the, what I call the moral status quo. And this is just sort of where we are, I think, philosophically. And in some ways, it's where we are politically, too. So what we have is basically two constellations point, that are in different, different sides, different parts of the sky. And when people get their hands on the ship of state, some steer in one direction. And other people get their hands on the ship of state. They crank it in the other direction. And the ship kind of goes back and forth. This is, uh, that happens in America, of course, but it happens even more dramatically in some other countries. In Chile, recently, some of you who follow Chilean politics may, may know that they've been swinging back and forth from a, a Michel Bachelet, a, a socialist of president, then to Sebastian Piñera, uh, a more neoliberal uh, free market president. And then Bachelet came back in. They swung back for socialism. And Piñera just came back in again. I've been in Chile recently, and I'm going there for a lot, a lot of the winter to advise, uh, advise the government about, about this other idea. But they've been going back and forth in kind of a dramatic way. Why is that? Well, I think it's because we have philosophy so far just has these two different constellations. So on one side, you can see on the, on the slides. On one side, we have um, a set of thinkers. I trace it back to Rousseau, but you could add Karl Marx over there if you wanted to. And the great recent theorist of this uh, left, uh, left, we'll call it left, political philosophy is John Rawls. And um, John Rawls and all these people on that sort of left side of people say, if you want to make the society just, go there. Go towards that constellation on the left, like the cluster of stars hanging over um, Denmark and Sweden, perhaps, or perhaps for some people, still Venezuela. But when they say go left, what they're thinking, what they're, what they're, their idea, the insight that they that they're working with is something like this. They say community comes first. So community first is their basic battle cry, and they argue because community is first, because because community should come first. They they, they say that means that we're all social creatures. And because we're social creatures, wealth is social wealth. You didn't build that as kind of a reflection of this kind of, this kind of way of thinking. Um, and so when they think about what the government should do, when it comes time to think, well, what, what is politically required by this way of thinking about society, they say they advocate a government of expansive powers, especially in the economic domain, to move the wealth around to reflect the fact that all wealth is social wealth that no one built anything by themselves. We all built it together. Therefore, they want to argue for social justice. And they're, because they are advocate a government that can have great powers to pursue social justice, they're very skeptical of, of economic liberty. They're very skepti skeptical of private economic liberties. So they have, on their side, as you can see on the slide, um, economic liberty, no. Social justice, yes. The alternative, philosophically at least, the main alternative philosophically, 
is the view that I'll call on the right. Um, I put John Locke up there. You could put Adam Smith there as well. Um, you know, many, many others. Um, uh, Milton Friedman is you know, one of my favorites on that side. And Friedrich Hayek, in my view, is the great defender, the great, great Rawls, Rawls is a great rival on these issues. And, and what these people think on this side, on the, on the right, they say individuals come first. They care about community too, but the important point for them is the idea of individual freedom, individual liberty, individual responsibility. And they think of people, let's say, on the Lockean, on the Lockean way of saying it, that human beings are, are not so much social creatures the way Rousseau thought we were, but rather people are self-owners. We own ourselves, we own our labor. Owning our labor, we can mix our labor with unknown things out there in the world. We can come to own those things in that way. And so they think property rights are built into the fabric of the universe. That's the natural rights tradition um, that David mentioned. And so when they come to think about what the government should do, when they ask now, if that's our philosophical view of the world, our ideas, ide our ideas of community and, and humanity, what should a government do? Well, they think that one of the most important things the government should do is to protect those property rights, protect those natural rights. So they advocate a government of very strictly limited powers, they are very skeptical of social justice. They're skeptical of the idea of wealth just being redistributed across the society to, per, to fulfill someone's ideal of what they think a, a justice distribution would be. And again, looking at the box, you can see under Hayek, I have economic liberty, yes. Social justice, not so much. Probably not at all. Hayek wrote a book some of you probably know called The Mirage of Social Justice, which in my opinion is widely been misread as being an attack on social justice. We can talk about that if you like. But that's the general view on that, on, on that side. Um, so we have this situation, the state of affairs, where we have, from a philosophical perspective, two rival views, incompatible with each other. Each of them may have some important power. Certainly each has the power to pull large groups of people, uh, morally pull on the heartstrings of large groups of people. But they pull them in opposite directions. And we're faced with this kind of unhealthy dilemma, ideologically, a failure, I think, of philosophy. And we're basically, we're basically being forced to choose between social justice or economic liberty, maybe democracy or capitalism, solidarity or individual liberty, fairness or free markets, one side or the other, everybody's got to choose. So, what I'm interested in, I mentioned that philosophers do this strange thing of making mar maps of the stars. And what I've been doing for a while now, uh, about 12 years, I guess I started, 12 years ago I started, I think, um, I've, been, I've been exploring a new constellation, a different constellation. And I sort of took the two constellations in the previous slide and combined them. You can see it on the slide, on the slide there. Those are both actually constellations that you can see from South America. I, I gave this talk recently in Chile, so I used, I used their, their stars, not ours. Um, but I'm exploring the possibility of a way of combining the con what's, the, what's good in both constellations while jettisoning what's defective in each constellation with the hope of finding and identifying and pointing out in the sky a higher moral ideal, a higher moral ideal that I think is actually morally much better than either of the two existing ones that we have, that we inherited. Um, and in this, on this view, on the view that I'm uh, exploring, I think of society as a community of individuals. We are together. We do help one another to create social wealth. That's certainly that's true. But we're also, importantly, individuals. We have our own lives to lead. The health of our society does depend upon our ability to, and willingness and our virtue to take on individual responsibility. So something like a society a community of individuals. And I think that individuals in this kind of community, this kind of community of individuals, each of us has two moral viewpoints. David mentioned Kant, and I use this from Kant, but I do a few twists in it. I think that each of us has the ability, the moral ability, to, to, to recognize that our life, each of our lives is important to us. So I look at my life, and I think about the things that I want to do in my life, and the people who I love, and I know that my life and my life projects are incredibly important. After all, they're my life projects, and it's the only life that I have. But so too, I have the moral ability, I think, to 
to recognize that just as my life is incredibly important to me, and my projects are incredibly important to me, so too each of you, each of your lives, is important to you for the same reasons. So I have the moral ability to recognize the importance of my own life, my own well-being, but I also have the ability to recognize, for the same reasons, the importance of each of my fellow citizens' lives. It's important to me that my fellow citizens' lives go well for, for similar reasons to the fact that my life's important, that it, that's important to me that my life goes well. So social institutions, I think, if they were going to be just social institutions, should reflect that basic <coughs> fact. It should reflect that twin feature of our moral personality. It should, reflect, it should both respect choices, our social institutions, institutions should respect individual liberty, individual choices, the important space for moral, res moral responsibility, but it should also be committed to the idea that in a just society, especially a wealthy society like America, no one should be left behind, provided they're willing to work, provided they want to be partic participants. Anyone who wants to be a participant, who aspires to live a life of meaning and contribution to this great social venture, should have a real opportunity to be, uh, to be a contributor. I think we owe that to all our fellow citizens. And so with market democracy, you can see, it says economic liberty, private economic liberty, yes, very strongly. But it also says social justice, yes to that as well. Let me now say a few things about what I mean about economic liberty <laughs> and probably what you're most wondering about, what I mean by social justice. Because I know that some of you are probably, I, I, there are audiences I speak to, I usually know which constellation they think is the right one or the correct one. And the audiences I usually speak to, um, when I'm not in Washington, D.C., our audiences at universities they all think justice is a star hanging over Sweden, something that only we could make America more just. More like Sweden, we would therefore ipso facto make it more just. You all might think that if you can only make America more just, we should steer it the other direction. I'm going to try to convince you, as I try to convince them, that in fact there's something higher that we should be aiming for instead. But let me say what I mean about economic liberty, and then let me say what I mean about, about social justice. So economic liberty. Um, you know, philosophers usually and legal scholars think of economic liberty as sort of lying in two big categories, two big bundles, I suppose. By private economic liberties, there's, there's, I mean, first, liberties of owning, liberties of, of ownership. For example, the right to own private productive property. Um, these are liberties that are involved with activities such as decisions about saving, decisions about spending. But there are also another category of economic liberties that are equally important, at least as equally important. These are liberties of working. That is, the right to decide for yourself how many hours you're going to work, or the right to decide for yourself at what wage you're willing to spend your time doing some work for somebody else. Those are, those are sort of the two broad categories of what I mean by economic liberties. And most people uh, on, the, on, the, on the right, most of my, um, my libertarian friends, or you know, we might call them neoliberals, they very often have an instrumentalist account of why economic liberties are important. Many of you know the studies that show the correlations between strong economic liberties and economic growth, um, strong economic liberties and democratic institutions as well, from Milton Friedman and, and others since him. And there's something, so there are often people argue for economic liberties on efficiency grounds. They say if you're going to have, uh, if you want to have an, an economy that works, you don't have a completely malfunctioning society, uh, you need to have economic liberty so you can have economic growth. And I think there's something obviously, obviously very important about that. But what I like to focus upon is not just, just that uh, justification for economic liberty. What I think of as the moral, uh, a purely moral justification for economic liberty. And David called it Kantian. There's actually some Rousseauian elements kind of plucked out and, 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 and mixed in with the, way I, with, with the way I think of it. But I think that economic liberties have a value uh, that is more personal, it's more directly, economic liberties are more, have a value that's more directly tied to what it means for each of us to be an agent, to be a cause of our own lives. I think an important part of us, and Charles Murray is very good on this point, an important, there's, there's, there's a, the, the stuff of life for most people um, is in, intimately connected with the things they do in the economic sides of their lives. This is true not just of, he of heroes of Ayn Rand novels, you know, Howard Rourke or the people that, who you know, build the great corporations, though it's true of them too. It's also true of just ordinary working people, middle class people. Um, I know from personal experience, my father died when I was young, and my mother raised me and my three sisters 
um, rate brought us up um, on her salary as a middle school art teacher. Um, she, she, she scrimped and she saved. We used to call her $3 mom because our cupboards were always full of cans of food that had these big red stickers on this for a dollar. Because my mother was involved in this life project of trying, of, of, of really diligently saving money so that we four could have a chance to go to college and to make something of ourselves. And I know that a part, a major part of the story of my mother's life was in that, those activities. She was who she was. I mean, she was a complicated person, as each of us is. But a big part of who she was was defined by these economic choices she was making. This economic project that she was quietly doing in some rural town in, in, <laughs> in, in, in New Hampshire, that, that, that this, 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 this activity that she was doing was central to the person she was. So too, I think that for many people, uh, all of you, there's a sense in which each of us, there's a sense in which the choices we make about economic decisions are fundamental to who we are. I sometimes tell the story about at Brown, that Brown students are always incredibly happy when they're freshmen and sophomores. They come walking in, I mean, Brown students, they love the place and they're like, among the happiest students I've ever, I've ever seen, much happier than they were at Princeton, and, at least from my observation. But they come into my office happy as could be, kind of, you know, waltzing. And they can, at Brown, they can, they can take any classes they like. They're just, it's a candy store and they're just, they're thrilled. But I noticed a strange thing happens to them, this change that comes over them when they come to my office, when they come back to my office as juniors and especially as seniors. Instead of just being happy-go-lucky children, by the time they're juniors and seniors, they come with a little tension in their jaw. And they want to talk to me about things about, will I write a letter, write a letter, write a letter for them to apply for Goldman Sachs Investment Bank Program rather than you know, whatever it is that they told me they're going to do when they were freshmen. And they start making, they start, even if it's not Goldman Sachs, maybe it's going to be you know, the Peace Corps or something like that, or a Rhodes Scholar, whatever, whatever it might be, whatever these things these brown kid, kids do. But they have this different look about them. They're starting to be, they're less happy than they were. They're like visibly less happy than they were when they were freshmen and sophomores. And it's because, I think, that they are now, for the first time in their lives, actually deciding for themselves what course of life they're going to go upon. And they're intensely aware of the economic effects and consequences of the choices they're making now. That is, what they're doing is crossing over the threshold from adolescence into adulthood. And essentially, an essential part of that process of becoming an adult rather than an adolescent is taking on those economic questions for themselves, of stepping out into a free society in which their future is not guaranteed, their future is theirs to make, they have the opportunities to make something of, it, of their own choosing, they have the opportunities to become the agents and, and therefore to become and define themselves as the persons they're going to be. So I think the economic liberties have this extremely important moral element and they express who we are. And I can say a bit more about that um, maybe in a moment. What about social justice? So I, think, so I think economic liberty should be argued for not only on, on economic grounds. That's going to be important, too. But I think the most important argument for economic liberty is to point out that economic liberties are important for freedom. That, and those choices we make about working and about saving, that's a domain of freedom. And in the liberal tradition, if you go back, um, if you go back 100 years, 150 years, if you go back 200 years, that was widely accepted by liberals, by classical liberals. But starting around 1850 or so, things started become, becoming, liberals started to become uncertain about that. And I see John Stuart Mill as being the great theorist that sort of started getting things wrong in this area. Mill started, Mill listed liberty, and on liberty is one of the best books I've ever read. It's a fabulous work of, of, about freedom. But in, in On Liberty, Mill says that these economic liberties this activities of, of applying for a job and getting rejected, of working really hard, of saving up and having those cans of three, four dollar stickers on your kids, on, on your cans and your, in your, in your cupboards. But those kinds of things are just things we need to do to do the really important stuff about ind individuation. Mill thought that economic liberties are just instrumentally necessary. They aren't constitutive of freedom in themselves. And there's a great divide that happens in liberal thinking. It begins with Mill around 1850. It goes on through John Maynard Keynes explicitly argued that economic liberties were only valuable for, um, for economic growth. And once we had enough growth, Keynes thought we should stop economic growth at all and, and, and get rid of these bourgeois virtues, as Deirdre McCloskey, the speaker in the series, will talk about soon. Um, and John Rawls is very much working in that same tradition from Mill through Keynes and then to Rawls when Rawls thinks that economic liberties are very unimportant. He even thinks that there's no right to private productive property. So, among, so the way Rawls pursues social justice is very open to, and in fact, it tends towards a, a socialist economy. I think that's morally wrong. I think it's not just 
naive or it's not, it's not just economically wrong-headed. It gets something fundamentally wrong about, mor about the pr moral personality. And even if you could make socialism work, which you can't, but even if, even if you could <laughs> make socialism work, you do something really costly when you do that. And if you have a social democratic society, a society that provides all kinds of material goods to people, all the material goods in the world, but denies them economic liberty, you're doing something fundamentally wrong to them. And again, Charles Murray's spoken about this, and I'm just gonna pick up on his line and rip on it a bit. Think about those Brown students, when I think of the Brown students uh, going on and becoming adults, what if they weren't allowed to become adults? What if they were gonna be going through their whole lives with people giving them fancy campuses and fancy food, food in the dining halls for free? and all decisions taken, a guaranteed basic income, whatever it is, whatever it is is gonna insulate them from the, this adventure of life. I think that we'd be treating them, we'd be, we wouldn't be treating them with full, with full respect. And I think the European social democracies, and similarly, something similar is going on there. Though they look like they're expansive, and, and though they look like they're respectful because they're so expansive, in some important ways they're not. That there's some fundamental failing in a society that gives citizens so much stuff as an expression of their concern for their fellow, for their citizens that in fact, without being aware of it, they're denying people the opportunity to become the individuals that they might be, that they have a right to be on their own terms. Social justice, more briefly. Am I running out? Am I okay with time? So, okay, so social justice. Um, I know, probably for you, the one that you, <laughs> that you wonder about. And if you look, if some of you are interested about, if some, do some of you know the Hayek book, um, the Mirage of Social Justice. If you look at it, and, and, and I just encourage you to check, check, out, check out the preface. Actually, the, it's a chapter in Law Legislation. Yeah, it's, it's volume two of Law Legislation and Liberty. It came out in 1974. In the preface, and on page 101, there's a, a little section where he says, uh, it's a, an attack on social justice, but he says in, the, in, in these two, point, two places in the book that there's a deeper sense where people use philosophy, the term social justice, to talk about the structure of society as a whole, and I'm fine with that. And he actually cites Rawls, uh, kind of surprised to know. But anyway, um, social justice. So what's social justice? What does it require? You know, philosophers disagree about this because we disagree about, about everything. But there are two main theories of social, what social justice requires. And you can call them social justice requires equality or social justice requires something like priority. Most people, most people I talk to in the audiences that I usually speak with, they think that justice requires equality. And it's pretty easy to show that that's got to be wrong. I can do it like in two sentences, <laughs> maybe four. Um, um, so on that theory, the theory that social justice requires equality, we, it, requi it, it implies that when we make a society more equal, we therefore make it more just. So if you want to make a society more just on this theory, you make it more equal, make the whole thing more equal. So for example, if you have a society with inequalities like this, I'm gonna channel Margaret Thatcher here for a moment. Her final speech when she was leaving, she taught me to use her fingers just like that. Um, if you make a society, how should you make the society, of the, so imagine this is a distribution of goods in a society. How should you make the society more just? Well, in this theory, we make it more equal. That's the, that's the idea, right? But notice, same principle, how should I make the society more just? By making it more equal. So let me make it more equal. I'm making it more equal. I'm making it more equal. You can't see, but I'm gonna make it like really equal. And now I'm down here, and it's like, it's, it's, well, it's, well, it looks like this. It's totally equal. Everybody's poor, desperately poor, let's say, but they're totally equal. Have we made it more just? Probably not. Justice isn't just about equality. Justice is something about the way people live their lives. Justice is something about the real substantive ability that people have to actually have real opportunities to actually make something of themselves. So justice cannot be, social justice cannot be about equality. It's gotta be about something else, something like priority. That is, social justice says to us, correctly understood on a prioritarian interpretation, if you wanna make a society more just, you should arrange the social institutions in such a way that over time, even the poor, everyone will do better, everyone will do better, including the least well-off members of society, at least the ones who are willing to work. So again, do the same thing, the fingers thing. Imagine, to, imagine a society, imagine a society that's pretty equal and a society that's pretty unequal. And imagine that over time, this society has strong private economic liberties, it celebrates the bourgeois virtues, 
It advocates the idea of personal liberty and personal responsibility in the economic realm. It celebrates entrepreneurship, let's say. And over time, it starts to grow. The economy grows. Let's imagine that it becomes more unequal as it grows. Um, I think I can't do my finger running longer from any higher than that. But imagine that it gets you know, increasingly unequal as it gets increasingly richer. On the prioritarian conception of social justice, which society is more just? Well, in the prioritarian conception, this is what Rawls do in fact, surprisingly, if you watch my thumbs, we ask about the least well-off people. And we say that society is more just where the poorest people are doing best. It is where the poorest people, the poorest members of the working class, people who are willing to seek jobs and hold jobs, that those people do as best as they could possibly do, given any rivals. So social justice is not a scary concept. It should be a, a concept that is, should be very easily welcomed by people who advocate limited government and personal responsibility, as well as people who think that entrepreneurship is an important part, an important driver uh, of, of, of American strength and American power. Social justice is, is something that we should welcome. So just to sort of run to the close, move toward my closing, um, I have a couple, couple more quick slides. So the, my general project is to suggest that we should try to think about ways to identify, to work out this new constellation that puts together the pieces, uh, the moral insights of the economic liberty, defenders of economic liberty, many of you, I imagine, with the, the correct insight from the defenders of social justice, the insight that simply having formal freedoms without any material means to use those freedoms is indeed a kind of a farce. That we really want for our fellow citizens is not really that they have the right to have property, that they have no property. What we really want for our fellow citizens, ideally, is that they have enough genuine opportunities to do things, to create things, to create wealth, to have jobs, to hold good jobs, that they can live lives of real contribution. What we should want, what free market people, what we free market people should want above all else is that all the talents of our fellow citizens, instead of being wasted through poverty and illiteracy and drug use and violence and the threat of violence, rather we, above all else, above, more than any else, any other group perhaps, should, should want our fellow citizens to be activated. We want their creative talents brought into our economy. We're the ones who advocate markets and liberty and responsibility who should most be concerned for the poor because we most think that it's important that those people come on board, join us in this great endeavor, make our society the amazing society that it should be, the great society that it should be. Um, do I have time for one more thing? Sure. Just one more. Okay, so I just wanna, this is a quotation I was trying to show you. So we should regard as the most desired order of society, the one that we would, this is what I call justice as fairness, and Rawls calls it that too. Um, we should regard as the most desired order of society, the one we would choose if we knew that our initial position in it would be determined purely by chance such as the fact of our being born into a particular family. And this is a, a, a quotation from a famous philosopher. I'm going to ask you in a minute if you, if you know who it is. But I just don't want you just to pause to see the power of this. This is the idea that is sort of the main idea behind social justice. And this philosopher's idea is that if you can imagine, if you want to know what society is just, you should imagine parties, or people, you and me, making choice behind a veil and we're looking at different social systems that we could choose, socialism, capitalism, social democracy, various mixed systems. And we have, but we'd be looking at those different societies with a veil in front of our eyes that makes us ignorant about who in, partic what, who in particular we're going to be in each society. So we're, gonna, we're, we're forced now to evaluate the fairness of societies, these different social systems we could choose, without knowing whether we're going to be a rich person in that society or a poor one whether we're going to be a super high IQ person in that society or you know, kind of a dimmer, per, a dimmer person, whether we're going to be a high energy hard worker from a, an industrious family, or whether we're going to be you know, kind of a lazy person who just you know, didn't, have, didn't have support from the family that's growing up. So that's a, that's a very powerful way of thinking about justice. Does anyone happen to know who, which philosopher this is? I mentioned this name, please. Yeah, so it looks like John Rawls, right? John Rawls in 1972 wrote this book, A Theory of Justice, which you, you know about, um, where he says something like this. Strikingly, this quotation is not from Rawls, though it looks just like Rawls. It's Frederick Hayek, and it was from 1940, 30, 30 years before Rawls. And Hayek tells this incredible story in a footnote to Law, Legislation, and Liberty, Volume 2. He tells this amazing story. But I, didn't, I read the book for years without seeing this footnote for somebody. In this footnote, Rawls, uh, Hayek, Hayek says, he describes how he was in London during the bombing, and as the bombs were coming down, things were getting worse and worse. 
And so he started sending letters to friends in different countries around the world and asking would, if, I'm, if he was killed, could, could he send his children uh, to live in, those, live in those hidings. And Hayek reports that by, he wouldn't know which, wh where his kids would end up. They would go to some family, a friend of his immediately, but then if he's put off to some other family eventually. So he wouldn't really know where in that society his, his kids would end up. And Hayek reports that in 1940, 30 years before Rawls, he began thinking about this as a generalized system that he might be able to use to decide which kind of social order is the most just one. That it's not just about a practical thing with kids, but that's what he was started on it. It's actually a very powerful decision procedure you could use for picking out the most just society. And he sent letters to people in South America um, and in, in, in the USA um, and in Canada and some other places. And some of you may know that Hayek decided that if he died, and his children had to be sent off, he wanted to go to America. Um, and by the way, just a little footnote to the footnote, Hayek also says that he chose America in 19 Mar uh, 1940 as the most just society, not knowing where his kids would be in it. Anymore. That's the that society he would choose. If they could be anybody, he'd rather have them have the chance to be anybody in a society built on American principles, because he thought they were morally right principles. But he says, interestingly, in the footnote to the footnote, <laughs> sorry, we dweebs love footnotes. He says that there's one thing that he, about the veil that he kind of knew. He knew that it was more likely than not, because he was white and his friends were white, that his children would end up in a, in a white family. And strikingly, he says that if he didn't know that his kids would, would end up in a white family in America, he might not have chosen America because of the injustices being done to black people in America. I mention that not, not just to say that Hayek was sensitive about racial injustice. He was, and therefore he's good. That's not, that's not my point. My point is just to show that, that is how deeply he was working with this, what we think of as a Rawlsian system. He was really trying to think, what would the veil be? How thick is the veil? What does the veil hide, or what does it not hide? And I'll just end with this, with this thought. This is, so, you know, so why, David mentioned that what I'm going to say is going to sound sort of strange in some ways. And when I come to, my, when, I go to uh, when I go to uh, my free market friends at, uh, at AEI or at, at Cato, or here at Heritage and other, other places around the country, or Hoover. When I go to talk to my free market friends and I talk about social justice, you know, I get a lot, I get, I get a lot of um, skepticism. The first time I gave an early version of this talk at, at Cato about 10 years ago, people literally threw like their programs at me. Um, no, not literally, but it felt, it felt that way. <laughs> um, social justice, really. Um, but this is what I think happened. We, we, um, there was this idea of social justice, which basically just means that in a decent society, no one who wants to participate should be blocked from participating. Or put another way, that in a decent society, anyone who wants to contribute should have the real opportunity to contribute. That is, in a wealthy society, no one should be left behind if, want, if they want to contribute. The surfers who do nothing except surf, let them surf, let them fend for them. If they catch some fish, good for them. But, but people who want to work, People who want to work should have a real opportunity to work. That's what social justice means. But what we got, so that's social justice. And what we got, though, was all these philosophers, people like Marx and other people since Marx on this tradition, um, working on uh, one conception, one, one interpretation of social justice that I call the social democratic interpretation of social justice. That's the main line that we've inherited, all the theories of social justice, every single one except the one that I'm working on, literally every single one, Michael Novak, but every single one, every elaborated philosophical theory of social justice is social democratic. And it's marked by that defect that I mentioned before. They're all marked by the defect that I mentioned before. They fail to see the moral importance of private economic liberty. They're all morally defective because they fail to see the defect of other, way, other reasons too. They're too optimistic about what they think the state can do, but also they fail to recognize the limitations of our ability to create the world according to our plan. But they're defective because they fail to see the importance of private economic liberty. And what I'm exploring, and I want to just share with you, is that there's, a positive, there's an undiscovered country, an undiscovered country of social justice, a path not taken that some of us now are beginning to take. So we accept a lot of the basic ideas of social justice, but we also recognize the importance, the moral importance, of private economic liberty. And I call that pro I call that approach market de democratic. I think there's a whole there's a room for a whole range of theories of, of market democratic accounts of social justice, 
each of which is marked by its commitment to two things, private economic liberty and to that idea that anyone who wants to work, if we can make our society fully just, if we can make our America the America it could be, they would able, act, they'd actually be able to make something of, the, of themselves in this country. And um, I call that uh, market democracy, but uh, some people call it bleeding heart libertarianism, a label I don't like very much, but a lot of people are attaching it to me. Um, I like to think of this as, as social justice American style. And the last thought I want to leave you with is, is this one. I believe that America has an extremely important role as a leader in the world. I think it's just extremely important that America maintain and even solidify our role as a global leader. But the reason why I think America should be a global leader, the reason why America has the right to lead, has the, the obligation to lead, and I think the right to lead, the, the obligation to lead, is not simply to stop the bad guys, though that's obviously a big part of it. The deeper reason is that, more, that America has the, the true, and it's implicit in our tradition, is something like this market democratic as, uh, approach to social justice. That in the best of our American tradition, is this very high moral ideal, higher than the pure left version, higher, I think, than the pure right version, is this idea that America is a genuine land of opportunity, it's a land of genuine freedom for everyone, not just formal freedom, but actual freedom, and America should lead because we have the best conception of social justice. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Hi, my name is Cassie. I'm a program associate at the Osgood Center for International Studies. I was just wanting you to go into more detail and expand on this philosophical idea, how it relates to the global world in regard to developing countries. Yes. What role can we play with that, with this idea? Yes. Um, so I've been doing some work in India um, on, 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 that, on, that, on, that, on that topic. Uh, I'm not sure I would count Chile as a developing country. Pretty remarkable what they, what, what, what's, what's been accomplished there. Um, but I think that in, in countries like India and in, in Chile, um, there is a tradition, a, a very powerful tradition that's very corrosive and very, very dangerous. And it, it's part of this tradition of the idea that the moral power is in socialism. That even people who are skeptical of socialism accept the idea that if we could do socialism, if we could actually have a functional, well-functioning socialist society, we should try to get it. And I think that's fundamentally wrong. I think socialism as a moral ideal is, is deeply defective. And so one of the most important things I think we have an obligation to do is to shine our light, to, to take the, 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 to hold our lamp up, to show people what a, a truly socially just, as I, I like that phrase, I know it's, <laughs> I know many people don't, but that what a true socially just society would look like. And to explain to people, partly, in part by our example, wh why our society is better than a socialist ideal. And I'll just give an example, if you, if you don't mind. This is, this is actually an example from, um, from, from my experience uh, trying to advise people in Sweden. When, I was, uh, my, my, when, my, when my book first came out, one of my big surprises was to find that it was extremely popular in Sweden, which I didn't expect at all. And um, when I went to Sweden, I talked to people uh, about uh, some things that had been going on there. And Sweden had been a socialist paradise, such as, they, such as it was in the 70s. But Sweden, as many of you know, has increasingly liberalized over the past, past several decades. There was actually a very free market before it became a socialist it paradise. Ranks higher in, uh, than in Sweden. I know. That's right. Yeah. Including things like they, in Sweden, they, they got rid of the um, inheritance tax. They have a wider school choice, so that's, that's in some jeopardy now. But sorry, back to your, back to your point. Um, when I talked to the Swedes, this is, this is what I, I said, why is my book so interesting to you? And it's sort of a boring technical philosophy book. Why, do you, why, why are you Swedes so interested in this? It's very, free, it's very free market. And they said, they told me, I should, the person actually did it this way, in Sweden, we liberalized looking down the barrel of an economic gun. 
So they all thought, these Swedes, that justice was socialism, social justice, but the reality of the world was such, the economic realities were such that they couldn't do that anymore. They were going to go bankrupt. They still may. We were talking about this a bit before. So they took steps to marketize, a lot of people more economic liberty, just only because they economically had to. And what I was saying to them, though I didn't know, I didn't write it for them, but I, what they were hearing me saying was that when they liberalized, as they started adding these economic liberties, they were actually making their society more socially democratic, more, I'm sorry, market democratic, more just. They improved their society morally. They made it more respectful of their fellow citizens when they started allowing their fellow citizens more freedoms, freedoms to do with, with to decide for themselves what they want to do with their wealth, for example, when they die, freedom to, to do with it, to decide for themselves what they want to do with the children's schooling. So they were forced off the solidarity moral ideal economically, but what they found was that they, that that economic gun moved into a better place. And what I was bringing them was the good news, as I think of it, that that's a better society, that's a more respectful society. And as a, one of some of you may know, the Swedish finance minister Anders Borg, who was going around until very recently, until very recently, talking about the, this very idea, he said that in in Sweden we shouldn't be thinking about we shouldn't be measuring the, the size of our hearts or the, the, concern, the, 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 the quality of our concern for our fellow citizens by the size of our transfer programs. He said, in Sweden, what we really owe our, owe our citizens is a chance at genuine independence. We owe them the chance not just to be dependent upon the state. That's not freedom. That's not respect. That's not equality. That's not even solidarity. If we really want to raise aim high or you get some great he has some great talks on YouTube. You can find him on there. He talks just like this. I didn't know it when I wrote my book, but he was, he was singing my song. We owe them the chance to be genuinely independent. Imagine if a Republican politician, and he had this phrase, Borg, they went around Europe saying that our, our program is to make work more comfortable than welfare. Imagine if a Republican politician said, I've got a plan for my, for my welfare reform. I want to make work more comfortable than welfare. <laughs> yeah. Right? But in the back, but, but in a society where there's a background acceptance of the idea of social justice, a firm mutual understanding that we're all in this together, and we want to we want to aim, aim genuinely high to a genuinely just and respectful and dignified society, they could say that. In America, because of this divisions we have, we can't say it. And if you all go around and start to saying, you'll probably be taken up and being taken seriously. That's why we have so much work to do, I think, to try to recognize that. This is, is a higher idea that we can affirm, too. And people on the left can affirm it as well, I think, in some ways. But they have to concede some pretty significant things. Excellent. That's a longer answer than I This think. gentleman. Hi, I'm Hyman Arbonne. And I, am, uh, I work with the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And I'm also in, involved in the National Economist Club here in DC. Uh, my question to you is, um, well, first of all, should the focus on income inequality in policy making and in think tanks be more evolve or evolve into a discussion of income mobility. And also um, what are the effects of getting rid of things like occupational licensing or barriers to entry yes. in order to achieve the social justice model that you want for market democracy. So great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. That's 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 um those are those are like those are those are core issues, and some of you, I'm sure, know that there was there was a lot of recent studies suggesting that income mobility in the U.S. is is not nearly what it used to be, and that in fact it may be lagging behind some of those European social democracies. So the, the, the data there is more mixed, but the data that suggests that there's in some important slice important slice respects less income mobility now than there was 40 years ago. There's, that's, that seems to be pretty persuasive to me. And it may explain partly why, as I see it, we're in kind of a wintry season for ideologies right now. It's not clear what people are even talking about ideologies. We're talking about a populist revolt against the whole thing because people are, are, are feeling the effects of that. I think that in a, in a, in a just market democratic society that is in a, 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 a morally just, in a, in a, a, more, a, a socially just American style um, society, income mobility is one of the most important um, things we owe our fellow citizens. And I think that it's uh, one of the things that I'm interested in when I talk about the higher moral ideal, so the two constellations, 
than the higher one that I described in the, on the up top. Here's, here's a really important point that I'm just gonna, I may throw some of the, what I've just said into, into uh, 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 so I'm just going to break it up a little bit. I don't think there's only one way to achieve market democracy. In my ideal political vision for America, we would have both parties, let's say two parties, um, affirming some broad agreement on that main idea. That is, the people on the left would have to get over the idea. They have to understand why individual liberty is so important, especially in the economic realm. And they have to be good over some of their ideas about the big state solving all our problems. It's a big ask. It's a, big, it's a heavy lift. But people on the, on the right, it's a heavy lift, too. It's to say, let's really commit ourselves, not just in verbally, not just for PR, but, ver but actually commit ourselves to the idea that in America, we're a society where no one should be left behind if they're willing to work. Um, once we're in that realm, though, there's still lots of room for disagreements. But the, I can imagine if both parties affirm that general idea, we could have much more healthy policy debates. Because now we're not pointing in different directions about what justice is and trying to argue about policy. We're pointing to the same direction, the same ideal, broadly speaking. And there can be room for reasonable disagreement about how, what measures best do that. My own view is that uh, the schooling system we have, the, the public go government schooling system, is one of the worst, um, one of the worst causes of this lack of income mobility. I think it's one of the worst exacerbators of racial um, um, inequality and racial animosity in, in our country. I think that, uh, that that's a, a, a deeply failed system, and I think it's one of the most important things to reform. Um, but I, I agree with you that income mobility, on that model that I was doing, um, you know, these people on the bottom have to have cycl cyclical possibilities. Because, you know, part of the American dream has always been that you could become anything. And, and, and if people think, that, well, I'll, I'm going up, and I'm, I'm just going to be getting a higher wage, you know, working as a greeter at Walmart, I have a on to the greeter at Walmart, so you know, no respect to the greeters at Walmart. But if that's all you can do. You can't, if you feel you can't move up at all, you know, that's not fully respectful. You should have, everyone should have the chance to, to cycle up. How do we get there? It's a complicated bundle of issues. But if we all agreed that we owe it to our fellow citizens, then suddenly the conversations could be a lot healthier. So too with healthcare. When you have one side saying, we're, we're care for social justice, you guys don't. And the other side saying, well, we care for something. We don't want to have a disastrous Obamacare. But if we could agree that people have uh, a wealthy society, we should all have quality health care, then it's an open discussion. What's the best way to really get there? It could let us do less posing and have more serious conversations about what actually works and what doesn't work. Is there anybody over here? This gentleman here. Gordon Johnson. I'm a retired businessman in the private sector. Thanks for coming. And you talked about the, the importance of economic liberty yes. versus sort of equality. Yes. And isn't equality sort of a straw man? You haven't talked at all about the problem of the safety net. Yes. It's sort of, I get the feeling of, of you, the, the ladder is very important for people to have the opportunity to get on the ladder. Yes, but sure. what about the people who can't get on? Are you just pull up the ladder, I'm up? Is that where we end up? Um. So I think, so the, in the market democratic model that I advocate, it's, it's a classical liberal, very clearly, a very, very explicitly classical liberal approach to questions about the social safety net. It's not a pure libertarian version, which often has no social safety net at all. I think there is an important role uh, for government to help people get onto the ladder and get them moving up. I think we have to be very, we have to absorb some of the lessons from public choice theory about how well, good intentions can go bad, how, um, Bureaucracies have dynamics of their own that can often lead to destructive, destructive ends. Um, but I think that the social safety net is one of the most important things to design well. Alexis de Tocqueville, who is obviously the great theorist of um, civil society in America, was so intensely aware, as people of his era were, more than we are, I think, about when you design a social safety net, we have to be so careful to think about incentives, to be so careful to think about moral ideals, not just avoiding perverse incentives, which is something we learned a lot uh, from losing ground in books like that uh, in the previous century, but really thinking about the power of positive incentives and the way we speak. Again, Deirdre McCloskey will be coming. We'll talk about this idea about bourgeois virtues and these, these cultural ideas of what does it mean to live in a society that has you know, the steady sense, at least, and more from outsiders of America than Americans themselves uh, very often, that America is a place where people celebrate hard work, where America is a place where people celebrate 
creativity and, and, and ambition, economic ambition for their families. So there's nothing wrong with working hard and wanting to make something great of yourself. That's a distinctively, not only, but it's a powerfully recognized the American ideal. So I think along with being thoughtful about how we design safety nets, we also have to really attend to our culture. We have to really attend to what ideals we discard. We have to be very careful about people who just, when people advocate a, a universal basic income, for example, is that compatible with them still saying we celebrate the people who, who make and who create things? I think it is, but we can't have one without the other. We need the cultural background. We need the moral, we need to keep reminding people of that moral ideal, that moral torch that America has always held up for the world. This gentleman in the back. <clears throat> Good morning, Professor. My name is Esteban Elizondo. I'm an intern here with the uh, Heritage Foundation. Thanks, um, thanks for coming. So the, uh, the quote you showed us alluded to the uh, importance of family and on economic opportunity. And I think it's safe to see a lot of marketing efficiencies are created by bad parents who aren't raising their kids with you know, the proper work values. How do you compensate for marketing efficiencies created by families who don't insult the proper values on their children without taking away the family's independence? Ouch. <laughs> That's hard. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that some of you in this room and in this building at, at Heritage could do far better with that um, than I can. I think that um, I think it is important to recognize the ways in which well-meaning state. It's not only by this. It's not only the state. I think there are, are, are very strong cultural forces unleashed by free markets that can have very negative consequences. Everything the markets produce in the entertainment industry are not ipso facto good. It's just because a movie is freely, freely produced without, let's say, no, with no subsidies, that does not ipso facto sanction or, or um, sanctify the product. Free markets don't always produce great stuff. They produce you know, a whole mixture of hurly-burly of things. That's why in free societies we, we have open conversations and should have very heavily moralized conversations all the time about what we think is good and what we think is right. But I would really emphasize that. I think that we have to be really mindful about the way programs, government programs, affect family structures, and that programs that are meant to do well for people often don't do, don't do well for them, and especially with regard to the families. There's been some, some fascinating studies done recently uh, connected to the thing David mentioned about economic liberty indices being higher in some social democratic societies, some, Norwegian, some uh, Nordic countries than in the US. And some of the studies strikingly say uh, that these, some of these Nordic welfare programs are, more in, are creating a more individualistic society than America. And part, which may sound strange to you. It sounds strange, strange to me when I first read that. But what the idea is, part of the idea and the effect, probably the strategy, but also certainly the effect of some of these programs is to liberate individuals from their family units. So if you, have, if you don't need to rely upon your parents or your, your college tuition, that's a different world. Your, your relationship between the children and parents are changed in some fundamental way. If you have um, you know, different kinds of divorce, divorce laws that really separate, allow people to separate easily without, any, without as much constrictions that we have perhaps in our society, that has some upsides for sure. Individual freedom is an extremely important value. But it also starts thinking about, about society as individuals first, ironically, rather than being embedded in, in these family units like you're talking about. It's complicated. I mean, my, my, my early my background is in sort of pure libertarianism. So, I, so when I heard the Nordic, Nordic democracies are in many ways more individualistic than us, I thought, wow, maybe they're better than us in that way too. But I increasingly recognize the importance of these, these social units. We have to think carefully about the way that our social welfare programs and our social safety, our safety nets affect family structures. And we also, again, as I said, have to attend to ideals. We have to have the bravery to speak out openly, to be critical of the directions our culture takes. It's important for people to uh, not be cowed. I'm sometimes in a, 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 it's more people not to be cowed by the majority, the moral majority on the left. It's important for people to speak up for traditional American values when they have the opportunity to do so. It won't solve the whole problem, but it's an important part of it. Last question, ma'am. The mic's coming. I'm Emily Maxson, also a member of the Young Leaders Program here at Heritage. Hi, Emily. Uh, you talked about the moral rectitude, um, which I think in any other context we'd prefer to call justice to save syllables, um, but the moral rectitude of both the uh, free market perspective 
or emphasis and the yeah. social justice perspective. Yes. Uh, there seems to be a straightforward, if not simple, test for a society to see if it is morally upright with regard to economic liberty and economic choices. Are you going to say what it is? Oh, no. I, oh, OK. Would you like okay. me to? Yeah, I'd love to. I'd well, love I would just suggest, as I said, not simple. Yeah. Um, but when people are making the majority of economic choices for themselves, yes. not being kept from it, does that seem valid? Yes. OK. I think that's right. I think that's, that's a nice, a really nice shorthand. All right, great, thank you. Um, is there a comparable test to determine a society's moral rectitude with regard to social justice? Uh, when is there enough priority? Nice, nice. I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> no, but I love, but I, but sorry, but I love, I, what I, I love the way you're looking for a simple way to put, like a simple one sentence test for each side. And the, and the one you formulated on the economic liberty side, that's fabulous. I like that, that, that's, just how, that's just how I would have done it if I had thought of that. So on the social justice side, I think it's gotta be something about the, the one, the question about, something about mobility. We think about Adam Smith, I can't get, I, won't, I can't do this on the fly, but just briefly, you know, one of the things that most struck me about Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations is his definition of a truly opulent society. I don't know if any of you remember it, but in one place, Adam Smith says that a society, that society, I can't, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mangle this quotation, that society is truly opulent in which any person, here's the mangling part, in which any person, by a little labor, can make a life for himself. Something like that. It wasn't just like, it'd be easy, <laughs> it's going to be hard, right? But the idea that anyone who wants to labor can make something of themselves, they can actually see the return coming back to them. I don't think we, I think a lot of people don't feel that now. I think a lot of people feel that it's a rigged game, that it's not the case that by putting in a lot of labor, they can actually make something of themselves. They watch these college tuitions spiral out of reach. They want their kids to, you know, my mother was able by being very careful with her money and very determined in her quiet way to send all, me and my three sisters all to private colleges. You know, she had saved so much money that we didn't get financial aid till my third sister was, was got to college. You know, she had like one of the lowest incomes for no financial aid and whatever. But now, could she have done it now, given what these spiraling tuitions are at these places? I, I, I don't know. It's, um, but something like, something about mobility I think is the key. It's not just who's got what, because that's the, that's, the, that's the insight from Anders Borg, that Anders Borg line about, we don't measure the quality of the society by what stuff we have, which this kind of suggests a little bit. There's got to be something more like about that dynamic view that people have about the chance to do, them, do something for themselves. One more question, this gentleman here. Thank you for that one. That was really good. Hi, I'm Jonathan Wilson, Institute for Humane Studies. To go off the gentleman's Hello. question. Hello. Hi. You're my people. <laughs> To go I was, I've been involved with the Institute for Humane Studies since I was a, um, a senior in college, and they, they, they changed my life. So. Oh, wow, that's great. I'm so respect, glad to hear respect. that. Um, to go off the income mobility. <laughs> now he's going to nuke me. <laughs> to go off the uh, income mobility question, what. I'm sorry, let, let, let me listen now. The income mobility question yeah. what policy or policies would you prescribe to help individuals? and lower socioeconomic classes to leverage into a new socioeconomic class. I think of Milton Friedman proposes the negative income tax where it's more of a market driven approach yes, yes. where individuals can choose how they want to spend their money instead of having social programs that incentivizes them yes. to stay in that socioeconomic class and not be mobile to move up because of the cost. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm interested in the negative income tax. Negative income tax. That debate about the about the UBI, the um, universal basic income, has taken, I, I think, unfortunate turns because of when, when some people were, were talking about it as, re, as a, way, a plan to replace the welfare state, it's now increasingly seen to be seen to be an accretion on <laughs> of a bigger barnacle on this massive um, on this massive ship. I think the I think the key place if we're going to think of mobility as the most important role, and I think it probably is. When I think it through, I'll, I'll probably come down on that idea. For me, it's education. And I think our educational system is really the key, the key point. I view our world as a world of um, um, untapped potential, untapped human potential. 
all around us, there are people I, everywhere. I, I sort of see, when I walk, I ride in a bus or on the street, I just sort of see, the, see this world. I see it myself and in my family too. We don't do what we could do. We don't, we don't become what we might become. And I think education is a big part of that. I don't just mean education like sitting in your desk being told what to do now by a private teacher rather than by a public school teacher. So I think that would be a, a step in the right direction. I mean a broader, freer way of thinking about human unique, uniqueness, about different forms of education that might be are, are valuable and have dignity. Vocational training obviously is part of that. But even broader than that, I think the idea that educating people to recognize their human potential and to recognize the potential of the people around us you know, America could do so much more if we could truly unleash the, the creative potential that we all have. And so I think the educational system, including the backup, as someone mentioned, with, uh, with family structures to motivate, to, to inspire, I think, that's, uh, I think that's the way towards social, social justice in America and the, and, the rights, and, the proper, and the proper understanding of it. Thanks for the question. Thank you, Dr. Tomasi, and thank you all for coming. I'd like to remind you that the next event will be October 11th, Sir Roger Scruton, the uh, conservative uh, British political philosopher, will be our speaker. Thank you again. Thanks.